Hello everybody and welcome back to the Tiny Fibre Studio. My name is Bex and you are watching a channel all about knitting and spinning and occasionally weaving, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. If you haven't been here before, then hi, welcome. Uh, grab a seat, grab a beverage. And this is uh, one of my project diaries, which is my way of documenting the projects that I create all the way from start to finish and imparting hopefully my experiences and uh, the mistakes that I've made and that I've learned from so that hopefully you can learn from the mistakes without having to make them yourself. So this project was my first proper weaving project by which I mean it was the first one that any degree of planning went into. <laughs> um, everything else has been very much just practice warps so just throw something on the loom and kind of see what happens. This one I'd done a little bit more planning for. It was based on a project in Handwoven Magazine's January, February 2020 issue, which was a set of waffle weave bath mitts designed by Amy K. Schneider. I am a big fan of waffle weave and I thought this would be a good first project. Incidentally, if you're not already aware, at the moment at least, as of recording this in April 2020, you can subscribe to Handwoven magazine either directly through their website or through the app. And if you, I did it through their website, you can subscribe month by month and you get access to every single back issue of Handwoven magazine which is insane. I had a lot of fun going through the 1970s editions. <laughs> anyway, um, this particular project was originally done in 6.2 cotton, which doesn't seem to be particularly accessible in the UK. Um, the nearest I could get was 5.2 cotton, which Ashford and I think several other manufacturers produce. So I managed to get some of that from Weftblown, and the only colour that they had left in 5-2 cotton that would in any way go with my home aesthetic was Celosia Orange. To explain just a little bit, I have quite a mid-century aesthetic in my house, so orange and kind of other 70s colours can actually integrate fairly well. The loom that I used for this project is my Louette Erica four shaft loom. This is the 50 centimetre wide version and I do have some extra heddles on that. Um, the four shaft version of the Erica comes with 200 heddles. I think I've got a total of about 500 on there now. Um, I just kind of added as many as I thought I would need for the tightest set that I thought I would ever use. So that is a little bit of an introduction to the project, so let's get weaving. Those of you who've been watching the channel for a while might remember that I do have a Kromsky Harp rigid heddle loom and that comes with these pegs which fit into the holes on the back of the loom so that you can use it as a warping board, which is very handy. I'm not using it as a loom at the moment, so until I get a proper warping board, this does the trick. It's not the most sturdy warping board in the world, so I'm sure I'll see the difference once I get a proper warping board, but for now, it will do the trick. There are a couple of things to look out for if you're going to be using a harp as a warping board. First of all, I've taken off the heddle block. You can see where the wood is a little bit lighter. That's where the heddle block normally goes. The reason I took it off is the last time that I warped on this, I kept finding that the heddle block was kind of getting in the way when I was winding the warp. So I've taken that off. That's really nice and easy to do. Literally just unscrew it. Very easy. You need to make sure that the pegs are really firmly pushed into place so that there's as little flex in that setup as possible. And I've also tied a piece of cotton around the plate that stops the hinge from opening because there's going to be quite a lot of pressure building on this side of the loom and that's also the way that the loom folds. So I don't want it starting to fold while I've got a warp on it, that would be disastrous. So I've measured out my guide thread, I've got that in place and that's cut to the length that I want my warp to be. I've also figured out which route to take on the warping board so now all of these extra pegs can come out. 
Now I did the maths for this project using the online weaving calculator, which I'll link to in the description. And I just played around with a few different options, a few different lengths and widths of fabric until I got as close to using up all the yarn as possible. I will admit that having the warping board on the floor isn't an ideal scenario. Um, I've actually got some ideas about how to use the ladder axe shelving in here to hold a warping board. I think the large shacked warping board is almost exactly the right width to be clamped to the ladders. So that would be really cool if that works. So I'm gonna try that. But at the moment, in a pinch, it works just having it on the floor here. I just wouldn't want to be winding a massive warp on here. I was kind of struggling to find a way to make this cone unwind properly off the side of the cone. So I'm using my Acreworks Lazy Kate, one of my favorite spinning accessories of all time, I think, to hold the cone of thread on half of an Acreworks bobbin. Even when I'd done that, I was finding that the thread kept wanting to unwind off the top of the cone. So I've just got the thread going through a Tensi Tamer, which is part of the Lazy Kate setup, to keep it unwinding off the side of the cone instead of trying to unwind off the top. I'm gonna have to do this in two halves because as I'm building this up, I'm just finding that it feels like I'm gonna be pushing it to get 280 ends on here. So I'm gonna time off my cross here And then I'll take this off the board and do a second one. I mentioned that having this on the floor wasn't ideal. Um, this is one of the reasons why. So I've been learning a lot from the Jane Stafford online guild. If you haven't come across it and you're interested in weaving and maybe just starting to weave or wanting to develop your skills, I would highly recommend it. Again, I'll link to that in the description below. And she gives a great description of taking the warp off the warping board in a chain, which is something that I'm, I'm really familiar with chaining things like fiber, but with a warp, you have to keep tension on it all the time. So in order to take this off the warping board in a chain, I have to sit on the floor and kind of wedge it between my legs and use my feet to tension it against. Not ideal, but you know, it works. I did a second lot of warp, so that's all the warp done. I'm gonna wind some bobbins and I'm basically just gonna wind the rest of that yarn onto bobbins because I wanna get through as much of it as I can. Even if I don't use all of the weft thread in this project, it's not gonna be enough to uh, be a significant part of a warp. So I'm just gonna wind it all onto bobbins. I use a shacked slim boat shuttle, um, the 11 inch version, and I wind my bobbins using my Hanson Crafts mini spinner as an electric bobbin winder. If you're just looking for a bobbin winder, there are obviously other electric options, but if you happen to have an electric spinning wheel that has a quill attachment, this is really, really helpful. The quill attachment on the Hanson Crafts mini spinner is just a tiny bit too thin to have the bobbin sit on it snugly. So I've just got a little bit of masking tape wrapped around the end that's closest to the orifice of the, the e-spinner so that the bobbin fits on nice and snugly and then it's really quick and easy to get the bobbins wound up. And so onto the loom. Um, the Louette Erica, which is what I'm using here, this is a 50 centimeter version, folds down for storage and for transport. So it's very easy to get ready for weaving. All you do is just lift the castle up from its horizontal position, slot it into its vertical position, and then just fasten it with the screw eyes that go in down here. So let's get this warp on the loom. The eagle-eyed amongst you might notice that I am making my first beginner error here because I forgot that there should be two lee sticks instead of just one. In this part of the process, the lee sticks are keeping the cross organized. And because the warp rod was already doing that, it wasn't immediately obvious that I was missing something. 
I did notice while there was still time to correct my mistake though, so I was able to just feed the second leaf stick in next to the warp rod and I've managed to pick all the threads back up in the right order, but you know, mental note for next time. Here I'm spacing the threads out across the raddle which keeps the threads organised as they're wound onto the loom and it keeps them spaced out correctly. Louette looms have a built-in raddle which is quite handy, others it's a separate piece that you kind of clamp onto it. And it was actually at this point that I realised my mistake about the missing leaf stick because I thought it was really hard to sort of um, read the cross and I didn't remember it being that difficult before so I referred back to the Louette video they have of warping the Erica loom and realised what the problem was. I think I would like to get hold of some wooden leaf sticks because the metal ones here can be a little bit slippery and it just seems like from videos that I've seen wooden leaf sticks would just make it a little bit easier to see the threads properly. Once the threads are all spaced out in the raddle it's time to actually wind the warp on. I haven't yet trained the cats to hold the warp for me while I wind on so I use some books to add some resistance. second mistake, or maybe I should call that a learning opportunity, was that I separated out the heddles that I needed and put the ones that I didn't on either side of the loom. Unfortunately I'd neglected to calculate that some shafts have more threads going through them in this pattern than others. <laughs> Fortunately I still had enough, just, but that is definitely a lesson for next time. The project in Hamwaver magazine does have a heddle count, but because I'd changed the number of ends, I didn't really think about checking that. I'd also ended up with a couple more ends than I needed because I didn't take account of the number of ends required for each repeat. So for example, this threading goes 432123, so you can't just stop halfway through that. <laughs> and I'd kind of forgotten about that, so again, mental note for next time. I've been learning a lot as I mentioned from Jane Stafford's online guild and I'm trying to get quicker at threading the heddles. I definitely find her technique easiest, she doesn't use a slaying hook or anything, she just does it all by hand, but at the moment I'm finding it quickest if my right hand separates the next heddle then goes and grabs the next thread and brings it through. I need to start trying to use my left hand more but that's something that I just need to practice. After a couple of repeats of the threading pattern, I just double check them and then I do a little slip knot just so that I know where I've checked up to. And then we're on to slaying the reed. Because of the way that the Erica's reed is made, you can sort of flip it forwards like this and almost just kind of drop the threads through. This project is slayed two ends per dent in a 10 dent reed and I think this is the first time that I've done more than one end per dent. I didn't record the process of tying onto the apron rod but essentially because I was playing yarn chicken with this project I kept the knots really 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 short and resorted to having to use interchangeable needle grips to help me grab the ends of the yarn to tension the knots. Lesson learned honestly in this case, yarn chicken is not worth the hassle. Just a quick little check to make sure that the sheds were clean and I hadn't sort of misthreaded anything and then I was on my way. The hope was that I could get two hand towels out of this warp, but I did have a plan B up my sleeve if I needed it. Each of the hand towels starts and ends with one and a half inches of flat weaving for the hems and then it goes into the waffle weave. This was when I realised that I hadn't taken account of my yarn substitution when I did the maths for this project and this meant that the set was too dense and I couldn't get anywhere near the number of picks per inch specified in the original project. I could have re-threaded at this point but honestly I would have had to do so much faffing around having to move heddles and all that sort of stuff that I just took it on the chin. It would have been too much hassle but again it's something that I'll be thinking about a lot more carefully next time. It did mean that throughout the project I had to beat really quite hard on both the open shed and again on the next shed. 
and the waffles still ended up being a little bit more rectangular than they should have been but it could have been far worse as you can see here there are floating selvages in this project if you're new to weaving essentially a floating selvage is a warp thread that is not actually threaded through any of the heddles it's just loose therefore the floating part of the name a floating selvage is used when you're weaving a pattern that doesn't catch the last thread of the warp on at least every other pick you just have to remember to go around the floating selvage on each pick i do this by going under it when i enter the shed and over the one on the opposite side but other people prefer the opposite way around as long as it's consistent it doesn't really matter I see a lot of people shying away from floating selvages, but I think when I first used them, I didn't realize that they were seen as being something sort of difficult or intimidating. I just wanted to produce a particular type of fabric. So I just did what I needed to do. This waffle weave is a pretty simple draft, which I could get into a decent rhythm with. I just had a piece of masking tape on the beater of my loom just to remind me what the sequence was but there were occasions when it was a great lesson in how to read my weaving especially because I was having to beat at several different points so I would throw a pick beat change the shed beat again and sometimes I couldn't remember whether I'd actually thrown that last pick or not or whether I would just changed to a different shed it's a little bit like in knitting when you can't remember whether you've done an increase because you were kind of on autopilot, but then you check and you realise that you'd done it without your brain actually committing it to memory. It's sort of like that. There were also a few times where I'd missed a pick out, but because of the waffle pattern, it's fairly easy to look back and be able to check which one it was. Because this project just required me to weave a certain length rather than a certain number of pattern repeats, I had a tape measure pinned to the beginning of the hem so that I could see when I'd reached the desired length of the first towel. Then I just did one pick in a contrast yarn and then moved on to the second one. Then I hit a minor disaster. Cut to the next day. <laughs> in a frankly shocking violation of social distancing guidelines, I have Jamie Oliver and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall helping me out with my weaving today. It's very exciting, isn't it? I can tell that you don't believe me, but here's the evidence. <laughs> One of my floating selvages broke, which was really annoying. Um, that's the first time that I've had to deal with a broken warp thread. So new learning experience. Um, but yes, Hugh and Jamie are currently waiting that floating selvage down. <laughs> As I got close to the end of the warp, it became fairly clear that I was not going to get two equal sized towels out of this. Although I still had quite a lot of uh, weft yarn left, so I just wove as much as I possibly could. Having cut it off the loom, this is the fabric that I'd produced. One piece which was a suitable size for a hand towel, for my dinky little hands anyway, and one piece which, if I cut it down the middle and then folded it in half, would make two bath mitts. So now onto the sewing. I should mention that my sewing machine has not been out of its case since I moved house, and that was about two and a half years ago. So it's been a while. I'm a little bit rusty with sewing, but fortunately my sewing machine was not rusty. <laughs> First, I sewed a fairly small zigzag stitch down each side of the contrast thread that separated the two pieces so that I could cut them apart. Next, I worked on finishing the hand towel, so I hemmed it with a folded half inch hem. I really like using quilting clips instead of pins for getting everything kind of lined up and secure. This is where a walking foot or adjustable pressure for the presser foot would have come in really handy but i don't have either of those options at the moment so that's the towel done now on to the mitt i pretty much followed the same process with this but obviously i had to um, cut the fabric vertically so i zigzagged vertically down the middle of the fabric although somehow i didn't get it quite in the middle i think my eyes just kind of shifted one waffle to the left I then cut through them to separate it into two pieces of fabric. Then I just hemmed them, um, folded them with the right sides together, seamed them down each side and turned them right side out again. So 
here they are. This is the finished products. Um, so I've got my hand towel. Um, these haven't yet been washed, so I'll take some photos and put those in at the end of the, the washed version. But I am pretty happy with those. Like I say, for me, this is a decent hand towel size. I can reach both sides of my hand with them. Um, there are a couple of mistakes in them, but they're not massively obvious. There is one here where I can see that it only has, uh, it's, it's got, I think, the number one um, shaft. That pick is missing, but it's fine. It's, it blends quite easily with the rest of the project, so you don't really notice it. I'm reasonably pleased with my hemming skills, um, given that obviously the waffle weave kind of draws in more than the plain weave. Um, so, you know, the ends kind of stick out a little bit, but considering it's actually not too bad. And then the other two, as you saw, I turned into bath mitts. Again, the right size for my little hands. Yeah, really happy with these. The project does suggest that if you have an inkle loom, then you could do some little hanging tabs for them. Um, I don't have an ink loom yet, <laughs> but I do have a little bit of the yarn left over. So it might be that I actually kind of retrospectively add some hanging loops at some stage later. So yeah, there you go. That is the end of that project. I hope that that was useful to you in some way. I hope that you uh, learned some lessons from that maybe or just reaffirmed the uh, <laughs> the information that you already knew um there are definitely some mistakes that i learned good lessons from in that project and ultimately i've come out of it with usable pieces which is really good and really exciting for me so i hope that this was useful for you if you enjoyed this video please do leave it a little thumbs up um comment and subscribe all of those things really 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 help the channel it helps me to know that i'm getting content that's right for you but also it helps other people to discover this channel and that might be useful to them as well so if you'd like to find me in between now and the next video i'm on instagram as tiny fiber studio and on ravelry i'm ibex thank you so much for watching hope this was useful and i will see you again soon